are here to talk about coordinated entry across the state. Um, we have Craig Rechlis, um, uh, oh God, Craig, the title, Assistant Deputy Commissioner of New York City HRA. Um, we have Denise Broad, Director of Client Services at CARES, which covers literally three quarters of the state, correct? <laughs> yeah. And then Allison McSpeeden, it was the system manager for the Westchester uh, Continuum of Care Partnership to End Homelessness. Um, so just about as you know widespread as you can get in terms of geographic diversity. Um, we decided that we wanted to talk today about the human impact of coordinated entry and the human response because coordinated entry, um, well, okay, I was, spoiler alert, um, I wrote the notice um, when I worked for HUD. Um, I haven't even introduced myself. I'm Abby Miller. Um, I worked for HUD for quite a while. I uh, wrote the notice for coordinated entry and um, really would rewrite most of it today. So um, I think that what we've seen over time is that uh, a system and plans and policies are no substitute for actual human responsiveness. Um, whether it is in the moment with frontline staff um, or the people who have been designated as the leaders to make the decisions. Um, it matters who's in that room, it matters who's at that table, um, and most of all, it matters what the people um, who are trying to access services need the most. And I think that um, these systems that we've set up um, have really taken care of some of the barriers to that happening, um, clients getting what they need, and it's also created other barriers, um, other issues. So today we're just gonna talk about the human response. Um, and I would like to carry one thing forward from, um, how many of you were in Regina Cannon's session at 1.30? Okay, so not that many, great. I'll, giving you new information. Um, so Regina and I work together a lot, and uh, she said something great about coordinated entry that I think is a nice <laughs> foundation for us as we start this conversation, um, which is that coordinated entry is based on a scarcity model, and we actually do have enough resources um, in the country, in the state, in our localities, um, if people so chose to designate the money in that way and if people in power who had access to the resources were willing to share. Um, so I think that is in keeping with our theme of the human response of coordinated entry. And one other thing that I will share, um, I was recently out in Portland, Oregon, and have noticed that all of the folks in our field out there have taken to um, using the term um, unhoused neighbors and really talking about um, this is my neighbor and I'm here to work in community with them and seeing the actual impact of how that changes um, what is, what's happening. Not only just what's offered, um, but lots of a give and take model or assumption um, or more of a what do we as a community need to do. Um, so, those are my human um, anecdotes. And I will pass it to Craig. So what we're gonna do, um, each of our panelists is going to do a five minute, I won't yell at you, but like once we hit seven, I'll start waving my hands and you'll be embarrassed. Um, they're gonna do a five minute um, overview of how each of their coordinated entry processes are set up. And then we're gonna talk through questions um, about humans. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for attending this uh, session on coordinated entry. 
especially in the afternoon. And um, I hope we can make this um, informative and interesting. All right. So uh, what we all decided was, you know, for each of our areas, we would kind of set the table for like how each locality um, has addressed coordinated entry. And so New York City being an urban area, having um, a larger population, um, we um, have um, developed a system um, you know, that is built on actually a system that we had before. It was a PAC system, uh, which was an electronic application system for supportive housing. And so we recently did a redesign of that in October of 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, so we launched our new system. And um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this system and then about the teams and what they do in, um, in New York City in, in coordinated entry. Also, if I have time, I'd like to do like a workflow of like what the intention is behind like, you know, doing the coordinated assessment survey through the uh, referral and placement process. So um, this slide is basically saying uh, CAPS is um, electronic, it's a web-based system, which is crucial to New York City given that we have a high volume of people applying to supportive housing and that we need to assess in the shelter for other uh, uh, housing subsidies. And so um, when we first started CAPS, we really did focus on supportive housing, but we do have other uh, potential eligibility results in the system um, when somebody does a coordinated assessment survey. That is our universal assessment tool, and basically a caseworker will do that. Um, let's use the example of in a, in a shelter program. And we geared this tool towards the, um, the new case manager. We wanted to level the playing field. We wanted everyone to, you know, not the seasoned case manager who may even know a lot about supportive housing, may even know about a lot of other like housing subsidies. Um, so we geared it towards the new person so that we make sure that the client is able to, um, you know, have the same level of service regardless of the competency of their, their caseworker. So they, the case, the coordinated assessment survey is our universal assessment tool and then the um, CAPS also includes, uh, when they do the survey, they can also, if they get the potential eligibility result for a supportive housing category, which is most of our business, um, they will. Th they can then just go into the supportive housing application. So it's a seamless system, and it actually pre-populates a lot of the supportive housing application for the worker. We're always looking for efficiencies. And then there's the vacancy control system, which is really on the housing provider side. So the housing provider side also has access to CAPS, and so what they do is they maintain their unit and tenant rosters so that we know like when there's a vacancy and um, if they request referrals, we know what kind of uh, the client eligibility that they're gonna need for that unit. Now that was a major shift for New York because we always did like, any tracking we did was a census model. It was just like you have 20 beds and you have 18 clients. We didn't track unit level detail I mean, that was unheard of, you know, but now we are. And I think that this is a major step forward in terms of being able to um, match the client um, based on eligibility. And so it really does help to, you know, create a path for the client and the housing provider um, to get the right client into the right unit. All right, and in addition, CAP serves the following HRA functions. Uh, there is a review and determination of the supportive housing application. So we have PAC reviewers in the system doing the eligibility determination. We have, um, as I said before, housing inventory management. So coordinated entry team, they, are, they assist the housing providers in the system to document their units and to you know, help do technical assistance because um, sometimes providers need that. 
And then there's vacancy monitoring for HRA, DHS, SRO contracts. And that is, um, that's a department within HRA that oversees the um, gen pop funding. And so they do some vacancy monitoring in the system as well. So it's kind of a very wide ranging system. Am I at five minutes already? You're at five minutes. Okay. Two more. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do the uh, workflow. So this is the workflow. This is how, this is the happy path, right? So let's not kid ourselves, you know, like this is, yeah. yeah. So this is, um, so um, the way that we designed our system is that, <coughs> you know, there's a caseworker working with um, uh, uh, um, someone who is unhoused, let's say, in the shelter. I'm learning uh, at this conference and I, I like it. Uh, the uh, caseworker completes the coordinated assessment survey. And so it's a short tool that uh, takes about 30 minutes to complete. And it, it's based on the client's demographics and we ask some, some clinical questions, some income questions, and then, um, and then at the end of the survey, what the survey does is it um, gives the worker potential eligibility results for supportive housing categories in New York City, which is numerous categories, and then other uh, potential housing, you'll see the arrow that goes down to potential housing eligibilities for other housing options. And so like EHV, which is a new subsidy that came out, so that all goes through the CAP system, city perhaps, those kind of things. So once they, um, what we've heard from uh, shelter workers when we've done pilot of the survey is that it's actually a very kind of um, uh, very good tool in terms of being client-centered because it doesn't ask a lot of probing questions and oftentimes the, uh, the shelter worker is saying that the client likes it because it's actually giving a result and they, they oddly enough, they trust the result that's coming out of a system like this. I know, I'm not saying this is across the board, but it does help sometimes with the engagement piece with the, uh, with the, um, with the unhoused household. So uh, the caseworker then uh, completes the supportive housing application if that's the path that is chosen by the um, individual. And then um, HRA determines whether the, um, the household is eligible for, uh, for supportive housing. And that's where we have the standardized vulnerability assessment. Tool. So the, think of it this way. The survey is, um, you know, kind of a, a, a like pre-eligibility and then they go on and they do real eligibility with the, the, the PACT unit determines whether they're eligible for the supportive housing, applying all of the requirements that we're supposed to apply. And, um, you know, I, I, I've heard in other forums like paperwork, over, uh, people over paperwork and just to say, HRA is on board with that. You know, we would love to you know, simplify the process, simplify eligibility, it'd be amazing. And then, um, so they get the standardized vulnerability assessment, which then, uh, that's a HUD requirement that um, they, they are ranked, uh, not ranked, but the assessment is either high, medium, or, or low in terms of their vulnerability. And then, um, and then the, then, um, they go on a list for approved clients, and that's when a placement entity can pick up that approved application and actually make electronic referrals to the housing provider in the system, to the particular program. And um, so depending on where the setting is or where the client lives or and their eligibility, um, it, you know, there's a number of different placement entities but the major a placement entity right now is HRA uh, placement. They do the majority of uh, referrals um, in the CAP system. And I think I'm gonna leave it there because I'm already over time. <laughs> but that's, that's New York City landscape in a nutshell. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you know. Sorry. <laughs> it was a clap for me, clap for you. <laughs> clap for everyone. So, Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone in person. 
Um, so I am, as Abby mentioned, um, Denise, uh, Denise Brott from CARES. Um, so I want to talk first about who CARES is. Uh, we are, do I hit enter here, Abby? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So CARES of New York is a nonprofit, and we partner with communities to end homelessness through community planning, program data, supportive housing, and awareness building. As Abby said, we cover over 37 counties in New York State, and we serve 12 continuums of care. In 11 continuums of care, we act as the planning lead. We have 12 continuums where we are the HMIS lead. We are the coordinated entry lead in three continuums of care now. And we also have our own housing unit where we offer permanent supportive housing. So we kind of have not our hand, but our whole body in a lot of different areas. Um, I'm here to talk specifically about our coordinated entry unit and I like you for the last six years have been building this plane as we've been flying it so I'm going to talk about what I've learned what we've learned through a lot of trial and error um, but in kind of three different aspects so CARES is the coordinated entry lead like I said in three COCs some COCs, we are there really to support the CE data management in an HMIS project. And then in other COCs, we're really there to offer technical assistance and talk about policy and oversight. I want to highlight two different coordinated entries today. Um, we have our urban coordinated entry um, in Albany, not as urban as you. <laughs> um, and then we have our rural uh, continuum of care, Columbia and Greene County. The main difference here is size, obviously. So in our rural community, we have about 48 people on average, between 40 and 50 people on our by name list. And we have five agencies or participating providers. So they either refer folks into our coordinated entry system, accept folks from it, or sometimes both. Um, in Albany, we have usually over 200 households on our coordinated entry list and over 50 providers. So um, in looking at the size here, I, I want to mention too that in Albany, there are about 500 beds that are utilized through coordinated entry. In Columbia Green, about 50. So the flow is much different in um, each of these continuums. They do both use a wrong, uh, no wrong door approach. So I like to say that this really helps clients present where they're comfortable whether that's an emergency shelter, an outreach station, uh, maybe it's with their care coordinator, somebody that they feel safe saying, this is where I'm at, I wanna be connected to services. Both of our projects use HMIS as the system for data entry. Um, but one big difference here is in Albany, where we have 50 providers, each of those providers is entering an HMIS assessment coordinated entry right into the system. So they enter it into the system, it's sent to the CE lead, and also other agencies that receive referrals in that system. And then the coordinated entry lead is really responsible for making sure that data is complete, making sure the application looks right. In Columbia Green, that, those intakes are done on paper. And then they're sent to the coordinated entry lead, which happens to be CARES, um, via HMIS. We feel like this is really the best way um, we really try to dissuade people from faxing, sending things through general email. Um, the amount of PII on these assessments is, is just overwhelming. So, um, Both of the programs report their vacancies pretty regularly to the coordinated entry lead. And if that's not happening, the coordinated entry lead would obviously reach out. Um, and then another big difference here is that in Columbia Green, our counties, our communities meet at a case review meeting monthly. Whereas in Albany, the amount of turnover is bigger. So we meet bi-weekly, um, except for twice during the year where we take a little break. But um, these case review meetings are super important to the process, and if you can do it, I highly suggest it. Another big important part of our process is our tool that we've all been talking about. Um, we use a local coordinated entry tool as um, opposed to something like the VI SPDAT. Now our tools, and I, I'm <laughs> probably a little prejudiced, um, I think there's so many benefits to having a local tool. We designed ours to be user friendly for the providers but also the clients. It's not overwhelming, it's not really long. We're collecting information that we need to house that client. 
That's it. We don't need anything else. Um, we also identify different levels and types of housing support. So we do rapid rehousing, we do permanent supportive or transitional housing through that same system. I think the best part of our tools is they were developed by the providers as a group who are going to be using the tool. So they talked about what makes someone in your community in need. What are you seeing in your community? We consider culture, race, and gender, various types of household compositions, family size, um, mental health issues, substance abuse, our youth population. Um, and then we do talk about implementing a trauma-informed approach to delivery. This is not done in the tool. This is done with training around the tool. And I cannot stress that enough, that these tools should not just be handed to a provider. There needs to be a discussion. How do you ask these questions? Why are you asking these questions? Um, and then the other really great benefit to these tools is they need to be revisited. These are revisited semi-annually, annually, when the community needs to do that. Um, most recently with the pandemic, we looked at are we prioritizing folks who have chronic illness? Do we need to do that so we can get them out of shelter safely and into a better permanent spot? As important as our tools are, and as much as I love them, we cannot make referrals based on a score alone. We have to remember that these case review meetings are necessary. That human touch that Abby was talking about. Just because two people score a 16 does not mean they need the same type of housing. So I always try to say to my clients and the providers, the next open unit isn't always the best open unit for that client. Um, and then I'm gonna run through our flow real quick. Do I have time? <laughs> over, but you know, okay. we're being equitable <laughs> with our overages. <laughs> um, so this is what our Albany <laughs> I flow. Set a precedent. <laughs> yeah. This is what our Albany flow looks like. The biggest thing I want to mention here is that first block that says client presents at point of entry or point of intake. That case manager, that provider that's helping them complete this assessment tool, their job is not over when they hand that in. They need to follow that client from point A all the way through this process to the end result, which is hopefully a successful housing opportunity. If we have folks on our list that don't have that person that we can reach out to when there's an opening, it doesn't make sense to have them on our list, right? We know our populations are transient. Um, we can't always reach them. We don't want them to miss out on a housing opportunity because their phone is shut off. So having that person that can reach out to them when, the, when a spot opens up is super important, so I really stress that. Um, and then the rest of the process here really is, it's pretty simple. That client is entered into the coordinated entry system, put on a by name list. At this point, they're able to be talked about at our case review meetings. Um, and then hopefully, um, at the first open spot, if it's a good fit for them, and we'll talk about that at our review meeting, they're then successfully connected to housing. I did put on here that we're discharging fro folks from our coordinated entry projects in HMIS. This is not as important to the flow for the client, but if your system's in HMIS and you're gonna be pulling reports and you're gonna be informing people but with this data, you wanna have clean systems. So once they're housed, they need to be out of your coordinated entry project. They can always come back in, unfortunately, if they have to. Um, this is our urban or our, our rural community looks almost the same aside from the fact that it's a little bit quicker right not quicker in the fact that the folks are on, are on the list is long but there aren't as many spots right the CE lead is doing most of the work on the back end and then those case review meetings happen monthly where the real talk of the clients is, is going on I want to mention real quickly the DV approach to coordinated entry. This is a huge, huge discussion in our communities. Um, the main difference here is we want to make sure that our domestic violence survivors are safe but have the same opportunity to housing as everyone else. So when we're talking about coordinated entry with our DV clients, what we want to inform them is we don't need anything else extra that's going to make it so that you feel unsafe. We need six pieces of information from you. We need a client ID. It, it doesn't have to be your name. Here I put AC. It's for Albany County Coordinated Entry Number One. 
Um, we need to know which county you want to be housed in, that number that you scored on our tool, um, the housing type required. So I don't want to know family makeup. I don't want to know daughters and sons. I want to know how many bedrooms. Um, are you chronically homeless? And then that point of contact, who should ideally be a DV case manager. The last thing I want to talk about is prevention. So we recently started using our coordinated entry system to refer folks for prevention services, which at first was really scary because we were like, how do we prioritize for prevention? It's a pretty immediate service. And we never had to in the past. We didn't have the resources. Um, so what we did was we looked at our process. We said, really, it's the same process, aside from the fact that if I do a coordinated entry assessment with someone and I'm a prevention provider, I might be doing that coordinated entry assessment tool and then also offering services that same day. That's great. If not, I'll refer them out. And then we had to look at our tool. We really, really looked at <laughs> a lot of different prevention tools. Um, the major difference here is we wanted to prioritize based on the urgency of the situation. Is the client, do, do they have an eviction notice? Do they have a rent demand? We also looked at, which is really hard, sustainability, right? Is this funding going to keep them out of our homeless system? Because that's what we didn't want to happen, right? We don't want to offer someone prevention services and then three months later they're on our coordinated entry list for housing. And then we talked to the communities about other priorities. So a lot of communities looked at past homeless experience, the size of their family, um, those types of things. So yes, coordinated entry is a lot of work. Um, but when you have the staff, the dedicated staff to do it, and hopefully sometimes the funding, um, you can make it work. <laughs> and it does work. It really does work. Um, we've been lucky, especially with these two communities, the community has bought into this. Um, and they, they, they really, really want it to work. So, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Steve, the slides will be available on the website. <laughs> and now it's you, Alex. There will also be an audio record recording, apparently. Um, so I'm sitting here. I'm from Westchester County. My name is Allison McSpedden. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking, oh, we're the little sibling, right? But I'm going to reframe that, and I'm going to say we're the filling in a delicious sandwich. Um, between, between our New York City and, and upstate uh, neighbors. So uh, the first thing I wanted to do was argue with you uh, that Westchester County is not upstate. Um, we border the Bronx, several of our major cities, um, and then to the north, you know, we have Putnam um, and Orange and Dutchess. Uh, but you can see the line. I found this online, by the way. So I'm not the only one on my side. So I have, I have backup if you want to argue about this. Um, <laughs> but this little yellow spot here is Westchester County. Um, Rockland is also included in this line. I'm not even sure I agree with that, but I figured this was an easy graphic <laughs> to grab. Um, <laughs> exactly. You got to cross a whole entire bridge, which was actually at one point the longest suspension bridge in the United States, but I digress. So Westchester County, um, we have about one million people. Um, we're a very diverse county um, in terms of landscape. Uh, you know, when I was a kid growing up in Yonkers, I knew exactly how far we had to go before we could see a horse. Um, and we do have those also in Westchester County. Uh, we start out very urban uh, at the base in southern Westchester, and then we go to uh, rather rural um, in northern Westchester, and those become very different populations to serve. Um, and very <laughs> different resources uh, that those folks have. So uh, our pick count, we had uh, 1,346 people um, experiencing homelessness. 47% uh, of total citizens in Westchester County are by POC, black, indigenous, people of color. Um, but 89% of our homeless people are, uh, which makes collecting data on how we are disparate uh, very difficult when your sample population is, is really small on one end of the spectrum. So we're working through 
solutions and efforts um, to, to rectify this. 96% uh, of people experiencing homelessness in Westchester are sheltered. Uh, as with my counterparts, New York is a right to shelter state. So we don't have any of what the rest of the country has in terms of prioritizing and triaging people for shelter. Um, we also have 56% of our housing programs um, are scattered site, which means you get accepted to a program and you're part of the housing search uh, for your unit. 56% um, of our programs, the, uh, the benefit of that is being able to place people in community where they want to be. Uh, the downside to that is the question of whether FMR continues to drive segregation. Um, and our other programs are sit-down sites, buildings, um, many of them newly constructed. So our coordinated entry structure, I was very literal about this assignment. Um, <laughs> we have our, our board and our co-chairs, and then the, the center section of our admin team who's doing all of the things uh, as they support coordinated entry. Everything, coordinated entry is the center really of our COC at this point because it's, it's really the how. Um, and then our direct service folks are our coordinated entry assessors, our outreach workers, and housing providers. So um, these are your, your advocates and your worker bees and your folks representing and advocating with each other. And to take you through the process, it's really easy. Um, access, assessment, prioritization, referral, housing, we're done, right? Great. Uh, so glad we had this talk. Uh, so, um, for access, uh, we use our, our DSS district offices as well as our um, shelters and homeless outreach workers who are working with people who are unsheltered. Uh, then in our as assessment, uh, we do have utilized HMIS, uh, coordinated entry as a project within that. Uh, people have to be entered. If they go into an emergency shelter, uh, that means a shelter that they can access 24 hours a day and they are placed there. Um, they can um, be entered into coordinated entry right away. For people who are using drop-in shelters, we um, ask them immediately if they want to be part of coordinated entry, um, but we give them the choice and then they are de facto entered after 14 days that, that they've been present. Then we de determine if the person has a disability and we look at their length of time homeless. Uh, we have what's called the CHAT, which is the Comprehensive Homelessness Assessment Tool. Um, we removed any questions that were uh, causing clients to make value judgments of themselves, such as whether their substance use or their mental health was <laughs> causing their homelessness. Um, removing the victim blaming from uh, the equation, we hope, and we continue to work on that continuously. Um, we only ask questions that are determinants of housing criteria for housing that we have to offer. And then referral. So our coordinated entry administrator, we have a single person who has backup, um, uh, who can refer from our prioritization list, and then that referral becomes the jump off for a conversation. Uh, this is what the person looks like they qualify for on the face of it. But then we have uh, conferences where we talk about every single case and whether or not that referral is A, a good fit, um, and B, acceptable to the client. Um, and if it's a great fit and it's not acceptable for the client, it still gets thrown out and we start over. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy and communication that has to happen. Because um, if we just did the data, um, I don't think folks would be real happy uh, with how they are integrated into the community following their homelessness experience. Um, they need advocates, they need supporters, and, and that starts, you know, at the top of this chart and goes all the way down. I wanted to point out um, how homelessness uh, is on the decline in Westchester. Uh, one of our pivotal things that we did was we joined 100,000 homes um, with uh, Community Solutions back in 2013. Um, and that really changed the game for us because we got tools we never had before. We started using HMIS in new ways and in, in 
concentrated ways, and yes, we adopted the VIs for that. As you can see, things dipped, and then they started to climb again, and we had to do something else. So um, in 2018, we implemented coordinated entry, and we also implemented utilizing our own tool for um, addressing homelessness in Westchester. Uh, so you can see that things continue to decline, and of course, I'm sure COVID had a lot to do with it because people are finding new and creative ways uh, not to end up in our shelters or on our streets in order to avoid it. Um, I put this here just in case you want to fight with me about <laughs> Westchester being upstate or not. Um, and thank you very much. And I look forward to this conversation. So we have 53 minutes, <laughs> not to be specific, but to be specific. Um, what do you all want to hear about? Um, we prepared questions and we talked about client choice. We talked about more responsive assessment tools, um, a lot about frontline staff, supervisors. What's the, what are we feeling? Yes, everyone who's in an emergency shelter is entered right away, unless they refuse. Um, and so we, we divide the types of shelter, we, emergency shelter as someplace you're assigned that you can go every day, 24 hours a day, and then drop-ins, which can be utilized by anyone. Um, and for the drop-ins, we offer it every day, but um, we don't automatically enter the person until 14 days, unless, of course, they refuse. So um, we discovered that we had a lot of people who are transient, and if they were going to leave, it typically happened before that 14-day point. That's where we had the most turnover. So we decided to start focusing on the people who had been staying longer than 14 days. And that doesn't have to be 14 consecutive days. That could be you were here with us a week in December, and then four days in April, and then now I've made myself do math. Um, you got to the 14 days sometime <laughs> in the summer, and you know it, it it flags you to to enter the person into coordinated entry. So we, I can you hear me. Um, so we enter our emergency shelters enter their clients into the HMIS project for their emergency shelter um, when you know automatically. But for coordinated entry, what we really try to say is. Give that client, especially in an emergency shelter, the night to settle. They're in crisis mode. It's not the best time to sit down and ask them a whole bunch of questions. So if they're there the next day still and they're meeting with their case manager, then it's time to talk to them about coordinated entry. And again, it's a client choice. So we talk about you know what it is, what types of housing are available through this. It's not a guarantee of housing, um, but I, I think that's, and so we mostly see um, with emergency shelters that happening. We also have a lot of clients who are connected through outreach services, especially in our Albany County continuum of care. Um, so these, these outreach workers are seeing these clients repeatedly. And sometimes they might see them for six months before they're ready to engage, and that's fine. And then when they're ready, they can complete a coordinated entry with them. Thank you. Are there other questions that you all have for any of the presenters? that are just burning to get out. <laughs> yes. Kathy, I'm really interested in knowing what you would do differently about this uncoordinated entry. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> could, could we use Robert's, Robert's rules and I can second that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think that um, the reason why I spoke to the one thing that Regina said of many things that she said that were um, very poignant and uh, on, on point. Um, the idea that, um, that we're working in a scarcity model, I think that coordinated entry coming on the heels of George W. Bush era 10-year plans to end chronic homelessness 
and then on the heels of HUD's uh, permanent supportive housing notices on prioritization that laid out a very clear and specific um, prioritization for PSH and chronicity or chronicity adjacent, right? Um, folks that are experiencing something close to chronic homelessness. Um, I think that uh, our, our timing and our wind up and all of the partners that were um, working in the field at the time um, that had you know, a lot of voice, I think we ended up um, setting up systems that kept a lot of people out. Um, and there was a, it felt almost feverish um, at the beginning of, you know, folks feeling like we have to find every last person who might be mm -hmm. on this priority list. And, and it caused paralysis in a lot of places. Um, and in other places it wasn't paralysis, but it was, you know, a series of um, detrimental impacts um, to the people in the, um, in the homeless system. Um, so I think I would go back to the concept of assessment for one and prioritization for two and really crack that open um, and talk a lot more about what people are experiencing, what different demographics are experiencing, and how you build a system that is responsive to a massively diverse group of people that don't at all have the same needs, desires, um, certainly not the same housing needs, um, and figure out how to make it work um, for more and I, I, for more of the population and specifically um, for in a lot of the communities that I've worked in more um, closely, it's been the black community and um, out in Oregon, done some work, um, the tribal members um, really left out. So as just a couple of examples, um, and we tied the assessment tool into all of this in a way that um, I sort of wish that HUD had never breathed the word tool. Um, I think it's an, it's an assessment process, but even, you know, hindsight is, is what it is. Um, I think even the concept of assessment rather than conversation with, um, it, re it stripped out the inclination to talk with a client about their strengths, what they want, <laughs> um, and it, it reduced that conversation in, in many places, not forever. Um, like, I mean, what you said, Allison, you started out with a VI spadat and then did something different. Um, and I'm not lambasting the VI spadat alone. I'm saying all of us <laughs> who were in leadership positions at that time um, made a lot of mistakes. Um, but it was, you know, this focus on vulnerability and weakness <laughs> um, when in fact people are quite resilient and strong. And um, if we leaned into that more, um, we'd get a lot more information that actually helped in finding housing. Um, not least of which is where do you actually want to live and where can you not live? Because that is um, a human choice. Okay. How was that? Yes. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Please. Yeah, I mean, New York is a deeply uh, 
inhumane place. <laughs> <laughs> as a, not the city government, I'm saying like as a New York City dweller, <laughs> it is a very inhumane place to, inhospitable I think is the word. Um, <coughs> but Craig, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. It might be hard to talk about it from within. Um, so Michelle, full, full disclosure, Michelle works on the PACT unit. So um, uh, I appreciate the question because I think what's being discussed at this conference is um, if you've attended some of the, the, like the city and the state, looking at like, we, bo we have new administrations. This is an opportunity, right? And so the way I look at it is that maybe we could revisit some of these, you know, like eligibility criteria that we set up. You know, there's, there's SMI and there's New York, New York one, and there's New York, New York three, and the whole alphabet. And do, do, do we wanna have some reform around that? Um, I don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater, honestly, because mm -hmm. I've heard from other localities that not having some kind of, you know, kind of targeted services for people. So like if you're set up to be a mental health agency, but you have somebody coming to you who's DV, that's not, that may not be the, like the right fit. So like w having a, a smart system where we can, you know, kind of collapse some of these um, eligibility uh, criteria that honestly, you know, HRA is in the position all the time of like, um, defending in a way, you know, <laughs> because we were the agency charged to do the eligibility around all of these different agreements. And um, so I think that now might be the opportunity that we're looking for with new administration of saying like, let's see what comes out in the city's housing plan. Mm -hmm. Let's see what comes yeah. out from the state and around, you know, any kind of reforms. It would be wonderful if we had a system that was like more humane. I think the survey tool is actually, you know, I know that that word tool may be triggering for people, but <laughs> the coordinated assessment survey is rather objective. You know, mm -hmm. like, um, I, like I said, it doesn't really ask a lot of invasive questions. It really is about like, can we get at some of the eligibility? But if we reform eligibility, you know, that would be great because I do think that oftentimes we are missing the people, you know, because of those eligibility requirements people mentioned, mm -hmm. <coughs> the criminal justice population coming out of prisons and jails. I know that um, people coming out of institutions where we can't count the homeless time, those kind of things. Um, so we do have to have something that is um, much more responsive in New York City that way. And so I'm, ho I, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic around that, and I know that you know, we, um, we have a good team. You know, we have the CAPS committee on our COC, which is a very active committee, and we um, have a good COC. And I think that um, we're in a good position. We just got an expansion of our coordinated entry. Um, so we got a little bit more resources, and so I think that we can, you know, have a, a kind of a systemic response to any like, kind of reform ideas to make it easier not only on the client, mm -hmm. um, but the worker who is, yeah. you know, um, helping the client, and then also we have to think about the housing provider and what they're what they're trying to, um, you know, uh, provide in terms of the services for the client. So. Yeah, yeah, and if I could just add to that, Please. I think um, education and communication is such a huge part, even within our, you know, on the, I don't know what you wanna call it, the provider side of things, you know, the COC side of things. Do our direct care staff and case managers understand what is on offer? You know, because every day something is new and changing and different. Do they understand and are they then able to be a good educator and communicator to the clients, because mm -hmm. a lot of times you're like, oh, your client has a referral, and the person's like, what is that? I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's that communication piece is, is huge. Yeah, could I ask, um, I know we talked in our, in our prep um, about the, the need to do more um, with and for frontline staff. 
Um, do you all want to talk a little bit about that? Denise, do you want? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, like I said when I was up um, at the podium, training around the tool. So if a provider is going to use this tool or assessment, whatever we're going to call it, um, with, a, with a client, they need to understand the questions. They need to understand what type of housing they're looking at, right? So what does permanent supportive housing mean? What documentation do I need to make sure this client can actually get in the project when they're eligible? Um, so we do try to do a lot of training around that and then really talking about when you're talking to a client assess the situation right we we're reading the client um, don't we don't want to re-traumatize anyone um, the you know the way that we we want to go about this is these questions are going to help us find you the best housing outcome and we're not asking it because we're nosy but if you you know it's so I, I have one example where you know that HIV question right in Albany County, we have specific housing for our HIV positive populations. And that's another avenue for someone. So if we don't know that, that's an opportunity they're missing out on. So saying something um, along the lines of, if there is housing available for someone with an HIV positive diagnosis, would you be interested? Mm -hmm. And that opens the door to that conversation instead of me just saying, you know, are you HIV positive? Or even worse, do you know your status? Because, well, yes or no, that doesn't really tell me anything, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Allison, I don't know if you have anything that you'd like to add to that. No, I, I really understand what, what Denise is saying, and I think it's super important how you ask the questions is important and my big thing and I harped on this a lot in our prep was understanding the why like do the people who work with you with you and for you and on behalf of clients do they understand the why of what we're doing and trying to accomplish because if you don't understand the why and you don't understand how people got where they are you're not going to be able to help them resolve it mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah. and I, I will say one more thing too mm -hmm. is that we have folks who are on our coordinated entry list for a year. Their situation changes. So that score, those questions they answered last year, they're different. I think it's time to start looking at reassessing individuals, you know, semi-annually um, to say, you know, what's changed in your situation? Um, obviously, if you weren't chronic a year ago, you are now, right? That's gonna give you a point. Um, were you pregnant when you came in? Now you have two kids. Like all of those things, um, the clients aren't just remaining neutral because they come on our list and stay there. Um, their situation changes. And, and other housing opportunities open up and their eligibility um, requirements are different. So we really need to be cognizant of going back to our list and saying, is this person really scoring this? And what's their story? Because the score doesn't always tell us that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that because I get people advocating, oh, can you please help this client? Mm -hmm. And then I look at their information in HMIS and I tell them, this is what I see. You sh these are the parts you should revisit. Yeah. You know, And I can't do that for every single person in our system, but I'm trying to train the people who are working with the clients how to think about it, you know, how to, how, how to formulate the ask and the, and the communication with the client so that they can really connect with what it is that the client needs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the structure and the rules and the system, and then there's the people and the connecting with the people and the connecting people with each other. You know, and, and one of the things that we're able to do because we're a smaller community with, with fewer people experiencing homelessness, we're able to have a permanent supportive housing referral meeting where we talk about every single person who has a referral. Mm -hmm. And we get, we get into it. You know, sometimes we fight, you know, um, because their providers are there, their homeless outreach worker is there saying, I am advocating for this client, this is what they need. And the housing provider is going, oh, well, I don't know. You know, they seem weird, you know, or whatever their, <laughs> whatever their issue, you know, I'm Very speaking to the centered. converted. I know yeah, yeah, that yeah. you know that <laughs> when pe people bring a lot to the equation when they're working with clients. Um, so it's, there's a really, there's a mutual support that's happening. There's a mutual accountability that's happening. That's really huge. You know, does this, what we're offering fit what the client needs? And if the answer is no, then we need to come up with a better plan. Um, and, and everyone who's engaged with that client and the client need to be part of that plan. So we'll sometimes have breakout sessions where we'll circle everyone who is working with that client and the client and say, hey, 
we recognize that you're having a hard time, what can we do better? What can mm -hmm. all of us do better? How do we make it work? So it, um, that's been very helpful. Yeah, I really appreciate the, um, <laughs> This, you know, this whole landscape that we all work in, um, government regulations and funding are, um, they are inherently inhumane because they are created at a scale that cannot control for the individual mm -hmm. human. And so our job at the local level, <laughs> when the rubber meets the road, is to figure out how to set up a system that the people within it can act in an efficient, effective manner, but not without losing their and everybody else's humanity. Um, and I think that's what you're talking about that's really Yeah, and, and nice. the mutual support of one another, I have to say, has been a huge factor because everyone knows that there are certain clients who you're in a really difficult situation with them, you're really embroiled and engaged with them, and you feel like you're all alone on it, mm -hmm. right? Because you're that client's advocate. And when you get into a room and you say the person's name and five other people go, oh, yeah, I worked with them 10 years ago. I worked with their mom when their mom was homeless or whatever it is. There's, there's a support and a supervision, um, to use a social work term. Um, it isn't pejorative in social work like it is in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, if you're under supervision, you're doing a bad job. Um, in social work world, if you have supervision, it means you have someone to talk to about the ways in which the cases you're working on and the job that you're doing are, is affecting you. And so mm -hmm. we try to create that um, mutual peer support between one another to, to make that happen for them. Thank you. I yeah. just wanted to add because I'm a part of Westchester <laughs> on the COC. So, and I think one of the things that has worked well, which you touch on, is that when we get, you know, when we have those coordinated Can activities. you all hear? Sorry. Yeah. Can you all hear in the back? Yes, okay, great. They should, because I know my rules. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I think works well is, to your point, is that you know, we have those coordinated entry meetings and names are you know, said, like, oh yeah, he was, you know, he was part of my shelter you know, years ago, a year ago. And so there's an opportunity to, um, as people come together to know that particular individual, we get more of the story. And so it also becomes not only But also, there are times where we've had conversations like, oh, this, now we know this person knows that individual, and that perhaps we can utilize that individual to engage. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, I'm more on the housing provider side, and so we meeting that individual for the first time, but now I just find out that these two other people, colleagues of mine that I've known, you know, since I've been part of Westchester, know this person very well. So we very well will collaborate and find a way to, you know, can we have a meeting and you know you include it in that meeting to sort of bridge that gap and you know really be more engaged? I yeah. think for us, and I'm surprised Henry mentioned this, when coordinated entry started, I, I correct me if I'm wrong because you've been around for a long time. I think the transition for us was a little bit easier because we have been doing safer housing initiatives mm -hmm. for the veterans. So we already had a core of providers that was meeting with you know with the county, the different offices. Mm -hmm. And that was every, every Friday for veterans. We had a mission to house veterans, um, to really limit the time that they were homeless, and they so rightly deserve that, right? And it's still continuing. Every Friday, we are discussing veterans that are homeless. Mm -hmm. And that was a priority. So when this came about, I think the transition for, for a lot of us was very much easier than, I guess, providers that were not participating in that initiative. And I think it was great. It worked for yeah. us, okay, for the veterans, and I think it's working. Yeah, practice makes habit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, question in the back. Hi, I have a question. Um, so I think it would be interesting to hear from you know, there's a lot of people with questions. What would be the strategies of those or perspectives of how to make our clients be more comfortable so they make the questions that we're asking just so they can work harder and we can get out of the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I, I, so I was the, the trainer when we were using the VI Spadat, and uh, I mean, full disclosure, and uh, you know, I was part of developing our, our current tool, and um, what I always do is I have the people who are giving it, I have a training for them, and I tell them, you wanna create privacy um, 
however you can. <laughs> Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that looks like, you know, meeting up on the sidewalk instead of in the shelter because the person doesn't feel comfortable like everyone else around can hear what they're saying. So you want that privacy and then you also want to educate the client why you are asking these questions. It's not because you're nosy. It's not because someone is surveilling their data. It, you know, it's because we have certain types of housing and by answering these questions accurately, we can refer you to housing openings that may be really perfectly fit to your situation. So we do a lot of that. Um, and also always give the client, you don't have to answer this question. You know, give them the, you got the carrot and the stick, right? You know, the carrot is, if you answer these ridiculous and invasive questions about your life, I could possibly refer you to housing. And then on the other side, right, I'm being real, on the other side is, you know, if you don't answer these questions, then nothing changes and your situation stays the same. So, and it's also like what you're bringing to the table, you know, if you feel in your heart like these are really invasive questions and I'm tasked with, with answer, asking people these questions and it sucks, then I, I want you to bring that to the client. I want you to say, listen, having to ask these questions so early on and getting to know you makes me super uncomfortable, but I'm really hoping that you'll trust me. And even if you don't trust me to have this conversation today, that we can have this conversation in the future. So, you know, can we talk about it? And, and that's kind of been my, my take on, on how to do it. I would say yeah. on the other side of that, um, half of what you're talking about having to do just should not be happening. Right. If there are questions that aren't needed um, for somebody's housing, I think that is a dicey situation. Um, I don't know if you're a director, a supervisor, or frontline staff. As frontline staff, um, certainly um, going up the chain and making waves is not great, but how is it going to change otherwise? So I think one of the ways um, is pushing for, there's an annual coordinated entry evaluation that has to take place. If there are not people who are currently in the system or recently exited from the system um, participating in that evaluation, then that type of information is never gonna make it to the folks making decisions. Um, so advocating, even for um, processes to change, like changing the evaluation um, can lead to the change that should be happening, um, even if you can't necessarily do it on your own, <laughs> or you know the power dynamic of, of frontline versus uh, director, right? It's, it's significant. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I also think that a lot of it is, you know, that the, the organizations that we're working in, is there room for you to be able to, to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, organizations who do what they do well are the ones who survive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it's kind of cutthroat to get funding, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think if you're an organization who's doing well, you're incorporating into your culture a way for when your direct care staff feels that something is unfair or doesn't work, there's a, a, an ear mm -hmm. to listen to that and take it in and, and make changes. Um, and, and I think those are the kind of organizations that we should be supporting and, you know, encouraging people to, to work at over, you know, places that are a little more cookie cutter or robotic. I, I think um, I, I just like to make a plug for like the coordinated assessment survey because um, you know, in our training, we always talk with um, direct care workers who are going to be doing the survey with the client about engagement. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. some of the questions are like legal questions because, you know, um, the um, because of HUD funding mm -hmm. in the units um, or LIHTC, you know, like there's all this federal funding that requires exclusion of certain people. And so we, we actually have that on our survey. But we, I always say to people, you don't have to ask these questions based, because of 
you know, you're, you have to really gauge your level of engagement with somebody. If, you, if that person just walked through the door and you're trying to provide services with them, you're trying to have um, a relationship with them where you're going to be helping them, you really don't need to ask these questions. There's like, so there's an unknown button there, mm -hmm. you know, like, so we can create ways to support people to, now, ultimately, the caseworker should know that these are exclusionary criteria, and that's what we say. You know, like the, like if your if your client unfortunately has like a sex offender or a meth lab, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, manufactures meth. Manufa <laughs> yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm just like, oh my god, like <laughs> what are these yeah. what are these rules? You you, you, know? you laugh, but it's easier to house an arsonist than a hoarder. So <laughs> right, 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 uh, but. Uh, you, you do need to um, take into consideration your level of engagement. It really boils down to mm -hmm. the worker and supporting them. And I think that like we've been examining questions uh, related to the domestic violence population and being uh, listening to um, you know um, uh, the community around those issues. And we've recently going to be um, uh, re you know. Uh, revising those questions in the survey to mm -hmm. be more responsive and be more client-centered. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a balance there, I think, that you need to strike. Yep. And then, you know, with good training and good, um, you know, just, you know, uh, engagement with the client to gain their trust, you know, then, you know, like, you know, if they see that they have, like, in our system, they see that there are results that they received, and these are potential, you know, avenues for right. them to resolve but their homelessness. But that's after you've put together a survey that actually is responsive. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's both. Yeah, it's yeah. Both. You have to have the structure in place, and then you, you do have need to deliver some it well. structure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, and you you got to give the 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 caseworker the tools to you know help the person. We have a what to do mm -hmm. next next to the the result you know mm -hmm. and so it's a guide mm -hmm. you know for them to go over with the client read with the client and then the client ultimately decides right yeah right. yeah yeah i wanted to say too um to your points um and i think he left but um if if you're working with a client in an emergency shelter like i said you know the first night it doesn't have to be done unfortunately in most of our communities they're not going to get housed tomorrow um, there oh, is yeah. a scarcity of housing. That's just something we have to deal with. So if they're in your shelter, if they're in your outreach program for a while, you develop that relationship with them. Or maybe it's not you. Maybe it's somebody else that works with that client. Maybe they have a care manager. Um, somebody else you could pull in to kind of help you with those questions. Somebody that they feel comfortable with. And I think that's where you let the client kind of take the lead to um, when they're ready to, to really sit down and talk with you or whoever that is. So let's talk about, um, for our remaining time, um, let's talk about your efforts to address the growing understanding of all of the racial and ethnic um, inequities that you've found in your systems, um, not only in the homeless system, but as you pointed out, Allison, um, you have a double proportion, right, of, mm -hmm. of black folks moving into the homeless system, which tells you everything mm -hmm. <laughs> about the, the world that we live in, right? So I think all of us have been trying to figure out how we can make change in a system that is not the whole thing. We're not the whole pie. We're not the whole community. But what do we do once people become known to us and once this inequity becomes known? Do you all want to talk about that? So I can, I can talk briefly about um, at CARES, we have a regional racial justice advisory committee. They work with all of our continuums of care on just this issue. And we went to them with our coordinated entry tools, and not just our tool, but our process, and said, let us know what we're doing wrong here. Let us know what we can do better. Um, so they've been doing that for us. And I think um, another cool thing we could do is we could go and do our projects, because they are in HMIS, and we can look at our list and say, what, what does the population look at look like that's staying on our list the longest and why? Because what should be happening is those folks with the high score should be moving off of our list 
And if they're not, we want to know why, right? So are the referrals being denied? And that's when we start to look on the back end at what that client looks like. What are the demographics? So that's been really eye-opening for a lot of our continuums. Um, it's a tough conversation to have with continuums because um, you know it, it's hard to look at yourself in that light, but it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. And I know for us, it's been you know we've formed a um, a racial equity committee, which we're now expanding to include more isms because as Audre Lorde said, we're not living single issue lives. Um, so your, your interse intersectionality is really uh, the bigger story of, of who you are and, and how things are for you. So um, we wanna look at um, disability and age and, and a lot of different factors. Um, and, I, and I had said in, in our prep, you know, I kind of, there, there's segments, there's the things that make people homeless there's us trying to resolve their homelessness and then what happens to them afterward. And I can't really get too deep into the, the causes, you know, and that's a super frustrating. But what I can do is we can coordinate our COC with organizations who are addressing the causes and support them and align with them. And like right now, I was just made aware that nonprofit Westchester um, has an initiative called YIMBY. So you've heard NIMBY, not in my backyard. YIMBY is, yes, in my backyard. Like you were saying about Portland, yes, these are my neighbors and they are unsheltered, unhoused. And, you know, yes, I want them to live near me. I want them to be part of my community. Mm -hmm. And they are as much my neighbor as anyone else. You know, so that movement is, is beginning and they're offering people signs to put in their yard and, you know, all kinds of ways for people to show that that they do support because a l the negative voices are loud um and the positive voices need to be raised as well yeah and i think that raise that um shows really clearly the coordinated entry i mean we, of we often talk about fixing coordinated entry um, but really what we're talking about is fixing systems um, because coordinated entry is just the, the path through the existing system um, and i think some of the some of the things that I've heard other COCs talk about, um, about how they're making changes um, now that they're seeing the racial inequities, um, in particular racial inequities, because of the rampant um, discrimination in housing. Um, and using, relying more on diversion on the front end, um, because it doesn't, it's more equitable. Um, prevention also more mm -hmm. equitable um, and for um, the you know when you talk about the the flow through of the system and what happens to somebody after they leave the system um, folks trying to figure out how to get aftercare dollars mm -hmm. um, to hang on a little longer um, to make sure somebody is is really stabilized um, Craig I don't know if any of that is um, a good prompt for you or if you want to go to a left uh, well, I, I would only say that I think we, we need to start going beyond like the demographics, you know, um, and um, th I think that in New York City, we, we have a lot of data and we are data driven. And I think that there's opportunity there to start, you know, doing more evaluation around like how this is impacting the processes that we have in New York City um, and um, particularly the referral and placement process. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know a lot about the accessibility to coordinated entry, but we, we don't know as much about that. We haven't concentrated mm -hmm. as much on that. I think that that's a good opportunity for us to start taking a look at it. And, um, you know, anything that's been done in terms of evaluation has been like, there's no statistical significance, you know, like that, that kind of sure. thing, which is doesn't seem like it's really getting at um, what we're talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. right? And so um, I'm hoping that we're, we're going to get to that in our CAPS committee in the, um, in the work that we do as we start to really start to take a look at the data. Yeah, and what is so interesting, I mean, with, with the three of you and the purview of the COCs, mm -hmm is how, um, Craig, for the city, the humanizing work is mm -hmm. still very system level. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> because there's going to be no way to get down to um, more of the 
the warm case conferencing, right, that's able to happen um, with lower volume. Um, it's, it's a lot on paper. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, admittedly, um, there are people who are working directly with the client, but the coordinated entry work is looking at the, the case and the information in the case, and there is discussions with the, the workers sometimes about like difficulties with placement and that kind of thing. There's a lot of case conferencing going on. There, there is something missing there in terms of the human touch, hmm. you know. Um, and but I think that the what people do is they, um, even though they don't meet the client, even though they're not working directly with the client, they feel that they become like the advocate of the client mm -hmm. because they're on the by name list. Our by name list is, you know, um, you know, 600 people. And these are your um, highest vulnerability, uh, longest homeless. Mm -hmm. um, and you, um, you start to see the pattern of um, where, and I will say the system has failed the client, not mm -hmm. the client has failed the system mm -hmm. and I think that they be, they start to take it to heart you know that they want that th they want to see a good result they want to see the client place mm -hmm. and a lot of that is matching you know um, and matching based on the clients preferences um, and we do have that in our application and we're starting to take a look at it a lot more closely in terms of the the role of the placement entity as well mm -hmm. um, so I think that that ha has a lot of opportunity to, you know, insert a human element, mm -hmm. even though like we're dealing with enormous numbers, you yeah. know, and, and systems, <laughs> and systems, and mm -hmm. different, you know, um, funding sources, and all of that kind of layering yeah. that we get. It's daunting. It can be system. daunting, <laughs> but we, we, you know, we. I think everyone has the. Okay, so when we started out. In 2015, you know, we we did try the VI spit at, and we we kind of realized that that wasn't really going to work because, you know, New York City has, you know, everyone is assessing clients. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm going to do a universal assessment for HASA and for DV and for you know, like we all just kind of were like, oh my God, this is not <laughs> going to work, you know, and and we also had the data to support it as we piloted it with our. Um, our veteran population mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, what we can do is um, just it, it's that uh, doggedness that you have to stick with it and keep at it you know mm -hmm. and so I think New York City has done that yes you we have. chose a path <laughs> and then we we stuck with it you yes, know you and um, mm -hmm. even though it is daunting because of the numbers you still have to like you said um, this is great because we, it, it's a reminder we have to like keep getting those opportunities to you know the human element in there we oversold caps in the beginning we said mm -hmm. you know like people thought that they were going to get like referrals automatically from the system and there was you know like i mean that's great that they like <laughs> embrace the system so much but it really wasn't that there was still people doing the referrals yeah. to the housing provider and that kind of got lost in our messaging and our zeal to like say hey coordinated this entry this will be easier <laughs> this will be easier you know but it it, yes. it 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 is easier in some aspects but there's still you know a lot of people behind you know each process yes. that you're you're trying to improve yep yeah. steve i i've been ignoring you i'm sorry <laughs> your hand was up a while ago <laughs> I will take compliments. Yes, yes, yes. Whenever. 
I'm joking. It actually makes me wildly uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a social worker too. <laughs> I used to work at the shelter. I used to work as a sport of housing provider. So, you know, you guys are all, you guys are all where you landed are all the coordinated entry idea. And are moving things forward in a way that I, you know, is, is hopeful. Yeah, it is hopeful. It's hopeful that we're having I'm these glad conversations. Glad you're, glad you're there. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah, and I think we, we kind of, um, in the, in the um, design of the New York City 1515, we're, we're getting away from that clinically, right? Like, so we said, you know, like, it's behavioral health issues, right? And so it could be somebody who is in recovery early, who is, um, you know, actively using or has a serious, uh, you know, mental person living with serious mental illness. Um, so it's all of those things, right? Instead of like all of the New York, New York three categories. Um, so I'm hoping maybe we could even do more around that, you know, so that, um, but w like I said, cautioning, like I think that we wanna do it in a very deliberate way where we, we don't lose the, kind of the target of the services on the housing provider side as well. Mm -hmm. You know, even though like, like you're saying, you're this person, you don't know whether they're E or A or whatever, right? <laughs> when they're in front of you, necessarily. They're but their right. Is supposed to be the, the most important thing. Right. 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 But then you layer it into systems. Yeah. <laughs> then you layer it into systems, and it it gets. I mean, it's as complicated as the systems that were built, and I think our our work is going back in, and you know. When we can blow out walls, we blow out walls, mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I I hope I really do hope that the city and the state can come together and start, you know, having those conversations about, you know, supportive housing, and if we could in the in the city at least, you know, like simplify eligibility for folks, and um, and it, mm -hmm. it's it's very complicated though because we have contracts and. You know, there's funding sources and all of these things that we have always worked to align. Mm -hmm. But maybe, maybe, um, maybe the one good thing that's coming out of the pandemic is that I feel like people are more open to like trying to think about like, you know, we went through this existential thing, and maybe, maybe we can figure out what's really important now, yeah. and um, that would be great. And I, I am optimistic about it, and I would be the one who would be doing the eligibility changing all of these things, you know, that are, you know, like the policies, decisions that we would be implementing it, mm -hmm. you know, and so. Um, I'm excited hopefully about this idea. Crossing fingers. <laughs> <laughs> are there other questions, comments? Nancy, yeah. yeah.
Well, I think um, that was actually one of the things I was going to bring up structurally, but we didn't talk about it on the prep call, so I was like, oh, that's, that's sandbagging. Um, <laughs> but I think that the, um, and I wonder what you all think, I'll say just a word. Um, the idea that we have these um, lower barrier places, but not really low barrier, just maybe more comfortable for some reason. Um, rescue missions, uh, these off the book shelters um, that are never gonna enter into HMIS, definitely never gonna take federal funding, state funding, local funding, maybe. Um, what does it look like to try to incorporate those folks and I mean the entities, the rescue missions, and and these places that are serving a very different demographic, um, and arguably some of the most vulnerable folks. What 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 could it even look like um, to incorporate those entities into coordinated it, entry? It could look like not requiring ID, <laughs> because that seems illegal when we're in a right to shelter state. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just saying. Maybe that's your next hurrah. <laughs> it could be, it could be. But right now, my, my present hurrah and the question that I annoy people with the most, so I'll annoy everyone with it, are we building a system that's easier for us or are we building a system that's easier for our clients? Because if we're not doing it for the clients, then we're doing it wrong. Uh, uh. I would say too, um, you know, the documentation that's required for some of our projects, it's, it's such a barrier for our clients, especially clients that Nancy, you're talking about, who aren't linked to medical care regularly, right? Um, they don't have the documentation to get into permanent supportive housing. So we'll put them on our coordinated entry list, but they can't leave it, right? <laughs> because they can't go anywhere, you know? And, and that's right. really frustrating mm -hmm. because, you know, they're, they have vulnerabilities, they have things that they, they could get documented even if, if they had to, but they don't even they don't want to engage, and they don't they shouldn't be forced to engage. Mm -hmm. There's no case manager that's just going to take track that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not in a shelter, and mm -hmm. the missions, for example, or even the hospitals, you know, when they leave, there's no one following them. So when they present again, we miss that moment mm -hmm. to get them on the list mm -hmm. and to follow. Yeah, it feels like you need like a wraparound outreach team yes. mm -hmm. yeah. that's actually doing in reach to places that can't yeah. can't or won't Not participate. Get them in the shelter, get them in the yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean more broadly, documentation is a very big issue. We encountered it um, you know, when uh, EHV needed to go through the coordinated um, entry <laughs> system. <laughs> And, um, you know, there's, there's like armies of people like looking, trying to obtain all the different documents that you're gonna need for that section eight, right? And, um, you know, in our system, it does return uh, documents on the client that were presented as part of like, if they did engage with HRA at one point for benefits. And so uh, it will return those like a copy of their photo ID, a copy of um, their SSI award letter, those kind of things. The, I think what the barrier is, and you may be speaking to a, a population that doesn't engage, is that y they ne still need to sign a consent with us to share information. They have to give you permission to share information with HRA in our system and then we could return those documents to you if we have them mm -hmm. in the system if they ever engaged with us which is great but it's still there's still a gap there right there's yeah. still a gap of people who are not engaging and um, and and what do you do when you want to have them go to some kind of housing that's going to require it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know they won't yeah. they won't have the document and so it's it's that conundrum uh, you, you, you need to have something that doesn't require it. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Or you need to have funding and I, to pay someone to help I don't know if there's anything like that. <laughs> right, like funding yeah. for staff, that that's their job. 
Like yeah. you th they know they need the documentation, so yeah. that's their job. They help that person get it, and it, that funding needs to be there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our continuums of care, their coordinated entry systems aren't funded at all, or they've gone outside to look for funding, so private funding, because they've realized we can't do this with volunteers. It's, mm -hmm. it's a big job. Yeah, it's a huge job. Um, we are just one minute past five o'clock. I want to respect all of your time. Um, I want to say one, two things, two things. Um, one, I am massively proud of the coordinated entry work and to get to work alongside um, folks like this. Um, we have been doing this for a long time. It feels like a very long time. Um, and we've made a lot of mistakes and yet we keep coming back to it. And that is, I think, the point of pride. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that for some of these larger barriers, um, when the COC and the ESG interim rule go back out for comment, that is a place that the federal government must consider your points, must. And if I could just give a small hack on these, um, when we I'll just say, use we, I'm not at the federal government anymore, but when we would read comments, when there is a, I don't like that, okay, that gets like a little tick on the negative side. But when somebody says, this is not working for my community and here's why, and this is what we did, and we talked to our lawyers and figured out that it is in fact illegal and this is the legal case that I would mount, then they really have to pay attention and at the end of the day, it is the lawyers in these federal agencies who are calling the shots. Wow. So when these open up, get with your lawyers, get with like-minded lawyers, and put together really structured feedback of this is what we wanna see. If you think, for instance, annual leases are ridiculous um, to qualify as permanent housing, mount that argument <laughs> and mount it with legal underpinning um that is that is a way to use advocacy to change um change things with that thank yep. you thank you Abby. <laughs>